that we have taken, uh, uh, less time we take up, the better. As Anne mentioned, we are recording this session, so you will be able to, you will be able to see it um, and to pass it on to your staff. Before we begin, um, I would just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're all meeting and pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging. For me, I am on the land of the Rundra people of the Kulin Nation, uh, and I certainly um, value the important contribution and to the fact that they are the world's longest continuous culture. So um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Nicole Battle and I am the CEO of Neighbourhood Houses Victoria and I'm also the chairperson of the Australian Neighbourhood Houses and Centres Association, which is the national peak. And we do have a number of um, people from lots of different states. So um, I'm really glad that you could make it here today. For what's a really exciting opportunity for neighbourhood houses? Uh, one of the things certainly that stood out for me being in Melbourne last year, and I know that it happened in other parts of the country as well, that when our state did go into lockdown and people weren't able to, to get out and see friends and family and they weren't able to make it out to supermarkets and when people um, weren't working uh, and food became problematic, that there were a lot of houses that were able to step in and fill that void. So many examples of, of houses that ran food banks, of, of put on um, made meals and had them delivered, I'm um, certainly, I'm looking at Greg from Wyndham Park. He did a lot of work in this space. There were so many houses that, that were, were incredibly active and it really stood out to me that we are an incredibly important network of making sure that people who are experiencing food vulnerability or insecurity um, have access to fresh food. So this is a really good grant opportunity and I'm not going to talk too much about it. I'm going to hand over to Catherine, who is the CEO of Feed for Peel. Um, who will talk more about the opportunity. But yeah, when, when she contacted us, I just, I know that it's a really good opportunity given that so many of you are working in this space. And a lot of you have said that only if you had access to more money, you would be able to do more. So yes, here's the opportunity. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Catherine to talk about, um, to talk about the grants program that's opening. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Nicole. <clears throat> um, and Thanks everybody for attending this webinar. Um, so as Nicole said, the Feed Appeal 2021 grants specifically to help build the capacity and capability of food relief in local community. Um, so if your neighbourhood house runs a food relief program, then you would be eligible for a Feed Appeal grant. Um, we give um, grant, there are three grant categories. Um, there is the grassroots or the rural grassroots grant, depending on where you are located. Um, this is for minor infrastructure, um, basic kitchen equipment, um, and the grants are for between 5,000 and 25,000. Um, our major projects grants category is for major infrastructure and capital works, vehicles, um, walk-in call rooms, that sort of thing. And they're for grants of 25,000 to 50,000. Um, and we do have a small grant category, which is for food staples through our partnership with PFD Foods, where we've got a basic pantry list of food staples, we would set up an account of either $5,000 or $10,000 in the name of the neighbourhood house that was successful, and you would be able to order online or via phone and have it delivered um, and draw down on that account over the um, subsequent 12-month period. Um, so the best and easiest way to sort of detail whether you're one, eligible for a grant, and two, which grant is best for you, is to go to our website, www.appeal.org.au forward slash grants. Um, and you can download a very comprehensive information pack that we've put together. It answers the most commonly asked questions. It talks you through the grant um, program and through the timeline eligibility criteria. Um, I have shared that um, with Nicole and Cameron. It may be something you want to um, distribute out as well. Also ran our own very detailed webinars last week, um, taking people through each section of the grant application. 
we also recorded that and that will be live on our website by the end of the day tomorrow. So you'll be able to watch the webinar. It goes for about 35, 40 minutes. We also answer sort of commonly asked questions because the webinar was live. I would strongly recommend um, doing that, especially if you've never completed a feed appeal grant application before. Um, we got some really good feedback that it was really helpful about what we were looking for in the different sections. Um, so the grants opened officially last Monday, the 15th of March, and they will close at 5 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time on Sunday, the 16th of May. So essentially, you've got eight weeks or well now seven weeks to complete an application, which is more than doable. But we strongly recommend that people start their application process um, pretty promptly and get a real sense of all the documentation that's required. Um, some of it, especially if you're applying for a major projects grant, um, there's a fair amount of documentation and quotes and mandatory information that is required. Um, it's clear what that is, um, but leaving it to the last two weeks can be problematic and we do get a lot of people asking us for extensions. We don't offer extensions. So as I said, the 16th of May, that is the um, closing date at 5 p.m. and we make no exceptions because um, we do get inundated, as you can imagine, um, with applications. Um, okay. So I was just going to say, um, so if in the chat we have popped the link to your website yep. and we will circulate the, um, the webinar once that's available to everybody as well. Okay. Uh, in the meantime, given that we do have Catherine here with us today and we're really grateful for your time, if there are any questions that you've got for her, pop them in the chat and I'm happy to moderate them through. Um, but yeah, I would also very much recommend watching the webinar. And just seconding the idea of not leaving things to last minute. I've done that before. Um, you're putting a lot of pressure on yourself unnecessarily. And the application is never as good as what you want it to be. So, so start early. And even if you only do the easy stuff, like, you know, um, most of you will have put in for grants before. So there's probably some things, you know, can fill in really easily, like what your organisation is and your purpose and all of those sorts of things. Because once you start, it's, um, you've got that momentum. So, you know, I'd encourage you to do that in the next week or so. Yeah. Thanks, Catherine. Right. Um, I guess one only one other point I would make is that I understand that the neighbourhood houses have a, enormous breadth of what you do, which we applaud and it's really fantastic. But please do be specific in the grant application that it is only about your food relief program. So it's not so much that we don't care about all the other amazing services that you offer and we understand how important they are, but we do provide limited word to keep it succinct to your food relief program. Um, we have an amazing group of panellists that review these grants, but it, to make sure that you're on an even footing with everybody else, um, really keep it tight in the information that you provide us. Having said, we'd just like to clarify that because you have breath, there is more financial information that you will need to provide because we do ask you for your overall organisation's financial position but then we also want you to break out your funding and your budget, et cetera, for just your food relief program as well. So there is a little bit more work in there when you're an organisation that has more breadth to it. Um, so I would just note that down as well as to why there are a couple of places that you will need to provide um, financial documentation in particular. Um, I would also like to say that we have a partnership with... Um, Clemtech Australia that are specialists in kitchen equipment and in fit outs, you know, whether it's cool rooms, et cetera. They offer some really amazing not-for-profit pricing to us and they give us a dedicated um, BDM. So there is a link in the info pack and on the website to download that. And we do that mainly to help people with quotes um, and to help people that if they're needing some sort of inside knowledge on the best equipment for them. Um, Clem Tech from last year, we got really good feedback from both um, applicants who needed quoting and then from applicants who were successful in purchasing equipment. Um, so just that's sort of something else that we do to support um, you through this grant action process. Um, Look, that's sort of it for me because the rest of the detail is really in the webinar and the info pack. Um, we are a small team here, but we definitely um, understand that your time is valuable. Um, we want you to sort of put your best foot forward. 
So after you've read everything and been and watched the webinar, if you still have questions or you need clarification, you can definitely um, either send us an email at info at or call the 1300 number and someone will be able to help you. We also have created a, a Facebook group specifically for the 2021 grant recipient. So if you are planning to um, put in an application, I would join that group. Again, the link is in the info at information pack um, because we will sort of um, quite promptly through that and also you'll be able to see but you know that because we're a small team sometimes it's a bit annoying to get 20 calls where everybody's asking us the same question in a day so we've sort of set up the Facebook group to try and minimize that as well um, so that's same for me Nicole look that's a really great idea and um, I applaud you for all of the support that you're giving to applicants through this process because uh, obviously you do want them to put their best foot forward and, and given that there's the webinar as well as the Facebook group I think there's plenty of support for people who are interested just one question for you before you go um, we're currently running our food relief program on zero income food is donated by the community in Oz Harvest would we still be eligible as an existing food relief program absolutely the, the Grants are not for new food relief, so you have to have operated a food relief program for at least 12 months to be eligible for a feed appeal grant. So it's mainly for existing programs and the support is either to support you because you've had an increase in your demand or you need to grow your service um, or you need to you know, extend the service geographically or to a different cohort of people or you need to change the service somehow. And obviously we're really conscious that um, anybody who's been in this sector has had to pivot and has had to adapt during co the COVID environment. Um, and we've actually found some better ways of working, which is great. And we wanna support um, the community through that because we also understand the demand the increased demand is ongoing, even as we start to venture out of and come out the other side of COVID. Thank you so much, Catherine. So grants close on the 16th of May. And uh, just from memory, the pool's about a million dollars, isn't it? It changes from year to year. So last year we gave um, one and a half million. We're obviously hoping to raise more this year um, and do more. So last year we gave 53 grants um, to, so we supported 53 charities, so we gave 53 grants. Um, and, you know, we gave actually a significant portion of major projects grants um, compared to the previous year, just due to the need. So we, everything's done on merit. Um, the one, sorry, the one only other thing I will say is that particularly the PSD, the Food Staples Grant, um, that's not, that's a one-off. So you can only apply for that for one year. And it's very competitive because there's only a maximum of 15 grants available in that category. So it is probably one of the most challenging categories to get a grant in. So I will just sort of highlight that um, because it looks like it's the easiest one to apply for, but it's the hardest one to get. Good tip. Uh, so, and on your website, will there are there links to um, are people who've been successful in the past to give people an idea of the sorts of projects that are funded? Yes, so you can um, definitely see um, the 2019 and the 2020 grant recipients. Also a good idea, I think, for people to do some research and to see the sorts of programs that have been funded before. Um, I would also note, Nicole, that several neighbourhood houses have um, received grants. I think there was about three that received grants last year. Fantastic. Um, so a question from Kerry. Do community kitchen programs and food carts qualify as food relief? Yes, absolutely. Awesome. Um, so thank you. Oh, sorry, there's no, just a couple okay. more. Um, so we've got been running a food bank outreach program for 12 months and currently setting up a food pantry um, as demand locally outstrip capacity of outreach provider. Plus, would this make us eligible? Yes, it does. Actually, look, we look more favourably anyway on organisations that are all using what is already available to them. <clears throat> so whether that's um, accessing food through food bank Oz Harvest Second Bite or Meals Through Fair Share or one of the meals programs. Um, we look more favourably if you're already collaborating in the space than if you're spending the limited resources you have buying from the supermarket, with the exception that if you're in a regional or remote community with limited access, we understand that. And there's definitely space in the application to, to detail that. Um, 
the, only, the one other thing I will also mention is we've created a really comprehensive um, postcode eligibility guide. So make sure that you check where your postcode and then which app, um, grants are applicable for you. Because if you apply in the wrong category, you're automatically disqualified. We don't even read through the grant application. So making sure that you apply for the right grant, um, especially if you're in a rural community. Because for example, Geelong, some people might consider that rural, we don't. So some of the major towns aren't considered rural and have to apply under the grassroots or the major projects grant versus some others like a Ballarat or a Bendigo, for example, in Victoria may, may be considered rural and you need to apply under the rural category. That's again a really good tip. You don't want to be knocked out for, for just not taking that time to, to double check your postcode. Um, there's a question about DGR and I did want to touch on this and because it's something that, uh, as I mentioned before, that I'm the chairperson of ANCA, which is the National Peak. The National Peak has um, runs a public fund, fund for DGR. So for those houses that don't have DGR status, they're going to be able to um, work with ANCA and um, and be able to apply in that way. Because just to confirm, um, if you, in order to be eligible for the grant, you need to have um, DGI, DGR category one. Yes. Um, and someone's just said that they've recently received um, DGR with PBI, is this DGR one? I want to say yes, Cameron, am I right? Um, PBI is actually slightly different, but DGR one or two should be acceptable, wouldn't it, Catherine? It's only DGR1, and the reason is because due to our status, we can only give to DGR1 charities. Okay, so we might have to check that, Sarah, because DGR, PBI is usually DGR2, which means you're a giving charity, which is what Catherine was just saying they are. Um, DGR1 is a receiving charity, which is what most of us are, or a doing charity. Um, but given that you're a neighbourhood house, I would say that you will likely got DGR1, um, but you might need to send me a copy of the document that registered you and I can check that for you. But for houses that don't have DGR1, what you can do is that, as I mentioned, Anchor has a public fund for DGR that we, that we run um, and you are able to apply through us. And so what would happen is that we would, um, you put an application with us and then you would um, put in your application to Food Appeal. But what would happen is um, the Food Appeal would pay the money to Anchor and then we distribute it to you. So that's that's the workaround for, for houses that don't have DGR in their own right. Ordinarily, ANCAR would charge 5% administration fee for doing that. But given, um, given that this is about making sure that food goes to areas where it's needed and that it is such an important thing, we're not we're going to waive that that administration fee in this instance. So all of the money will just be part um, because we do want to see houses um, be able to successfully apply for this for this money. Um, um, I'm going to hand over to Emily in a little bit, Emily, who is the grants officer with ANCA, and she will talk a little bit um, about that process and what you need to do in, in all uh, we, We're going to make the process really easy. So we're almost um, we're going to, um, any house that's looking to apply for this funding, um, we sort of give them kind of say yes to that you can do it. And then if you're successful, we'll, we'll do the paperwork work afterwards. I think that's what we said. It wasn't it, Emily? rather than make you go through the process in, um, um, prior. Um, are there any other questions about DGR? I'm just seeing if there's anything else in the chat, um, but I will get Emily to talk through that process in more detail. Are there any other questions for Catherine? Thank you so much for your time, Catherine. We're going to pass on all of this information um, to the houses, to the ones who are here today, but we'll also spread it across the sector more broadly. Uh, and yes, absolutely. Uh, go to their website, look at the um, look at the webinar, and join the Facebook group. And put um, the 16th of May in your diary today, and um, put a couple of reminders in, like a two week reminder, four week reminder, because this is definitely not one that you want to leave to the last minute because it is competitive. Yeah. Thanks for that, Nicole. Um, I'll send. I'll forward to you and Cameron a link. For the webinar. So if you want to send that and the info pack out. Um, that'll probably help everybody to get started. Fantastic. Thanks, Catherine. Great. Thanks very much. Do you need me to stay on? Or? No, it's up to you. You don't have to. I know you're busy. Okay. That's all. Great. Thanks very much. See you, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Catherine. Um, I might hand over to Emily now, if that's okay. We're going to also talk to Sophie as well. But Emily, did you want to just talk a little bit more broadly about the public fund? 
Yeah, sure. Um, so the public fund, as Nicole said, is, is sort of given a pretty good overview of it anyway, but it's, um, yeah, it runs the um, public fund for DGR. So it enables houses uh, and centres around Australia to access that DGR status by putting an application through us. It goes to a DGR committee for approval and then it comes back to you. And so the funds go through the public fund and then out to the houses. Um, it's certainly a space we're continuing to kind of work and advocate because um, the status in its own right for the houses and centres would be wonderful, but at the moment, um, yeah, anchors has been put into the Tax Act and this is a way that will enable houses and centres to be able to access um, funds that require this DGR1 status. Um, so in terms of this application, we, as Nicole said, we want everybody to be able to access this and um, it, it really is amazing and it's so important the work that houses and centres are doing across the country in this space. So. Um, my, we will send out when we send out all the communication. Um, I'm just emily at anchor.org. And so um, if you're putting an application in, what you'll need um, from us is a like a, a letter that just says that you've been approved to go through that um, and getting that DGR1 status. So you'll need to be in contact with me before you put in your application, just so that you've got that attachment that you'll be able to put in with your application. Um, and we will do... Uh, as as Nicole said, a very kind of streamlined to get this to happen easily for you guys to get your applications into the feed appeal. Um, yeah, so we'll send out my details and it will be just simply that you'll need to get in contact with me and let me know that you're putting in an application um, and then I will work out the, the anchor magic from our side and um, get that in touch with you so that you'll be able to have that um, documentation to put with your application. Um, and Emily, given that you are the grants writing guru, are there any other tips that you would like to share at this time? No, I think that um, just from what Catherine was saying, some of the things that kind of stuck out to me was she did talk about succinct. I'm not good at succinct. I'm a waffler, big, lots of flowery words, lots and lots of them. By the sounds of things, the way she described it and the fact that they will have a lot of applications, keep it really succinct. Um, one of the things too is that... Um, in the paperwork, the other thing that stuck out from what they were saying is trying to be succinct, but also to highlight what it is that you're doing in a really, um, our sector is extraordinary and I feel so lucky to be part of it, but what you know and what you do in the in the sector and in this space, um, yeah, trying to kind of find the words to make that come alive is a really difficult point, but you know, you know your community, you know why you need to do what you're doing, you know why you're doing what you're doing. So those two things, making it kind of personal, but but being careful on the waffle. Um, yeah, don't waffle like me, but yeah, that two things I think that would be my pointers um, just from what Catherine said and just going through that um, the documentation, but happy to chat to anyone too. You know, I know that they've just talked about a small, um, you know, a small team, but I'd be certainly happy if you've got ideas or whatever that you, um, you know, would like to throw around. I'm happy to help people with that too. Um, yeah, Emily, I think um, I think probably my takeaways, and it'll be great if you can watch the webinar, mm -hmm. um, just so that if people have questions, I probably would almost suggest you go to Emily in the first instance, because my takeaway from Catherine was that they are a small team and they feel as though they put lots of things in place as, you know, with the Facebook page and also with the webinar, that they actually don't want people to ring. And I think sometimes people want to ring because they want to, they've been told that they need to make contact with the funder so that the funder knows them and, and so that, you know, that when their application comes through, they're going to go, oh yeah, that was, that was Chris who I spoke to in his application. I don't think that's what they want, particularly if you're ringing and asking questions that they've already um, done FAQs for. I think that's going to put you on their bad list. So um, if you do have one of those questions, can I suggest that maybe Emily in the first instance? Um, just, yeah, that was my takeaway from what she said, and I could be wrong, but, um, but yes. No, I think absolutely. And obviously if they've done a webinar, they've done it twice, and she's highlighted that they've done that and there's going to be questions. I think that they're pretty much suggesting that all of the information that they can think of at current stage is in those in those places. So um, definitely worth doing that. And as Nicole said, sometimes it can be really beneficial to speak to funders. This doesn't sound like that kind of a thing, especially to ask questions that they've already got information on. So that's that's what today was for as well, Emily. Yep. Is that they now know who you all are, um, and that was why we've got it to agree to come along and talk to you all directly. So when you identify as a neighbourhood house, when you're doing your application, um, they're going to pay attention to them. So it's you've already got that connection. 
I think um, I do think, as she mentioned, I think there was only three neighbourhood houses that were successful last time, but they didn't receive that many applications from neighbourhood houses. And there was some speculation as to why that could be. It is a slightly, um, it does look a little bit daunting as an application process for starters. And so I think the DGR stuff as well. Um, but hopefully we've um, been able to, to mitigate both of those to some extent. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think they're pretty keen to see more applications from neighbourhood houses, as are we, because we know that um, given how much food we've given out over the last 12 months and how active we've been in this space, we're probably one of the um, one of the biggest, um, probably one of on the ground, um, biggest sort of footprints in terms of food relief. So I think it was disappointing not to have more. Um, Heidi said that, Heidi, what did you apply for last time, if you don't mind um, letting everyone talking about this? Yeah, sure. We applied for a vehicle because um, due to COVID, we were doing a lot of transporting and around. We actually did end up getting a grant from a, from a state government and have now got the vehicle, but we weren't successful. And our application was pretty thorough. I mean, as you know, Nicole, we do a lot of grant applications. Um, yeah, and we did end up getting it through a different funding, a pile of funding, but yeah, we didn't get, we weren't successful with this one. <laughs> Which again, um, Heidi is a really like your grants, your your hit rate was actually really high. So, did yeah. they give you feedback as to why you weren't successful? No, and they actually said they wouldn't give feedback because otherwise they'd have to give out so much feedback, and that's pretty standard, as you know, with grant applications. But yeah, we do have a pretty good hit rate with our grants, and um, yeah. I mean, we have got the car now, but we, yeah, we didn't get it. And it was a pretty strong application. We spent quite a lot of time on it. Yeah. So hopefully we'll get a few more through this time. And, and I think by um, us making um, contact with them behind the scenes, um, we've certainly helped to raise the profile of neighbourhood houses and why they're really good organisations to put money through. Um, so fingers crossed. I'm hoping that we will get um, get some good traction this time. Um, sorry, Heidi, are we going to? Sorry, I just wanted to ask too, I'm wondering whether or not because we do receive federal funding, whether or not that was something that they didn't find as attractive because we do have um, DSS funding for our emergency relief program. Do you think that might have had something to do with it? Well, it's a national program. So I don't know. Look, I wouldn't have thought so. But um, yeah, I wouldn't have thought so. Cameron, have you got any... Uh, yeah, it's it's possible because they might have a strange criteria when it comes to that. They are they usually source funds from PBIs, so they're not they they themselves don't source a great deal of government funding. They're getting some good publicity now, though. Um, to be honest, I think it might be more a case that they didn't didn't think of neighbourhood houses collectively when you've applied. So they look at individuals as being a community centre, which is nothing wrong with that. They all are. It's just that I think now that we've approached them as a collective in a way and said this is this is what we're doing everywhere they may be more inclined to go okay we should pay proper attention and probably not score things against someone if they were fed federally funded okay um i haven't looked at the application process um in detail but if there is an option for letters of support um we're happy to provide one um certainly um through anchor we're happy to do that um so we'll make we'll make a bit of a template as it for for um, for houses that would like that. Um, and yeah, Emily, I'll get to have a look a uh, detail through the process and to watch the webinar. And if there's anything that stands out to her, uh, we'll certainly pass that information on to everybody. Um, was there any uh, if there any questions about any of that, or else I'm just going to hand over to Sophie, um, who's from uh, the United Nations Association of Australia Victorian Division, uh, because one of the things I was going to just mention is linking your application potentially to the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, in um, uh, particularly zero hunger. Thanks, Sophie. Thank you, Nicole. Um, uh, one of the zero hunger reports is one um, that works so well for the uh, neighbourhood house sector. Um, particularly through uh, food relief, um, like you've all been so involved with over the last 12 months. Um, the other part, Zero Hunger, is very much about uh, both uh, eliminating uh, hunger um, at an immediate uh, level, like you are all doing through uh, the food relief. Uh, it's also about trying to establish sustainable agriculture and sustainable practices so that people can continue to have access um, to food and secure food, nutritious food. Um, Zero Hunger, the goal is also about 
uh, decreasing malnutrition. Um, and uh, so nutrition is part of it. Um, it's not just about um, getting rid of hunger. It's about also improving people's access to food so that they are more productive and less likely to get ill um, and have their impact, have their livelihoods impacted. Um, and it's also about trying to set up sustainable agricultural practices. Um, access to local markets is very important, and that's something that um, I know neighbourhood houses have a, a role in um, by providing uh, opportunities for local growers um, to sell um, through your local markets. Um, uh, I know a couple of neighbourhood houses are uh, involved now in um, the bulk grain um, uh, so that people can come and get, bring their own containers um, and buy food that way, which is another way of um, local producers and um, being able to provide access. Um, but as um, Emily and others will know who are involved in grants, um, the SDGs are becoming more of a, um, a, a way to, uh, to reflect on what you're doing, to make it part of a global um, practice, to show that what you're doing is having an impact widely. Um, and so um, there is a lot of information about the SDGs um, and I'll make sure that we get some information out as well on um, to you with all this other information on SDG 2 um, and saying how the role it plays. Um, and there may also, I'll just have a quick look around too, there may also be some information about localising the, um, uh, the grant, uh, the um, goal, sorry. Um, there are there is a lot of information about localising the SDGs, um, and so I might see if there's anything useful I can find on this particular goal that might be able to help you in your grant application as well. Absolutely, and given that we have got you've effectively got not quite eight weeks, I think for your application, so um, definitely start early. And another, if you think if there is um, an a, a option to do what is the support. The other one that could be a pretty powerful one is if you reach out to your local council. Um, certainly they've got a vested interest in making sure that there's food um, in their community, in their local community. So, um, but that's one of the ones you don't want to leave to the last minute. So the sooner you can kind of um, get them going on that process, the better. Uh, so I'm going to get, so Emily, I'll ask Emily to send around. We've talked to her about sending out um, information about the webinar um, and the, 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 also the stuff that Sophie's going to put together. You might get Emily if you want to send that around because then people will have your contact information so that they can um, contact you if they've got any questions through the process or if they want to coordinate a letter of support from, from Anchor. So yeah, Emily's probably a go-to person. Um, thanks to Emma for organising today's session. Uh, Cameron, did you want to say anything else? Uh, just where anyone can uh, go ahead and make the application if you get the chance to. There's a fair bit of work in it, I know but Anchor probably won't be able to make this offer again to waive the fee. Anchor's unfunded, so it actually exists by having that 5% fee. Um, yeah, so take advantage of it. They've got plenty of money and I think we've got a good position with them now. So yeah, if you can get it in, get it in. Emily's happy to help and I'm happy to give Emily a hand if she needs it, um, if we get a lot of applications in. Uh, that is a good point. For those of you who um, weren't aware of that, with the, or you weren't aware of the um, public fund for DGR that Anchor runs, it's not just for this grant program. You can use it for any other grants that you apply for or donations as well um, that require DGR. Um, so that's available to any neighbourhood house that's a member of its state peak. Uh, and uh, But yes, ordinarily we would take a 5% administration fee, which helps us to fund the, the, the state, uh, the national peak, given that we don't get any other funding. Uh, so, so yeah, that's, um, and there's all information about that on the website. Um, and Emily, from time to time, also does run information sessions about the um, public fund for DGR as well. And I think we've got some of those coming up across a few of the different states. So um, keep an eye out, out for those if you want to know more. Uh, and if you don't, if you're not, a, if you're not, um, if you haven't done it already, go to the Anchor website. Maybe Cameron can put that in the chat. Um, I would highly recommend you go to the Anchor website and there's a button where you can subscribe for updates and you'll find lots of useful information. So whenever we get um, information about uh, federal or national grants, we always um, we put it out to members uh, and, you know, these sorts. So we also run a lot of the Zoom sessions on the sustainable development goals and just other kind of interesting things. So, and there is going to be a national conference or an international conference um, late this year, I think in September. That's going to bring neighbourhood houses um, from all across Australia together in Sydney. 
so yeah, it's um, a really good website. There's lots of good resources there, lots of good information about the SDGs. And there is a button, isn't there? Um, subscribe. Um, so do that, that would be fantastic. Um, but thank you very much for every, your time today. Good luck with your writing. Um, I would like to think that that we are well positioned to be getting um, a decent uh, a decent cut of the pie. So, uh, yeah, and we do have Stan Grant speaking at the at the conference in Sydney, which would be a bit of a draw card. And I think there's a few other people that we've got flagged as well. So it'd be great if you could come along. Um, thanks for today. Um, again, to thanks to the team and good luck with your grant writing. And yeah, no doubt we'll be in touch soon. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone.